Maria, it is such a pleasure having you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure. So I just finished your latest book, The Biggest Bluff. It is amazing. I want to start with uh, something that I was fascinated by when I first delved into literally just the first pages. And I found out that you paid tribute at the start of the book to Walt and Michelle. Mm -hmm. I, when I started this podcast about three and a half years ago, Walt was one of the people that I wanted because of his book, uh, The Marshmallow wow. Test. So then I delved in further and I found out that he was actually a, uh, a graduate advisor to you, I believe. He was, I was his last, uh, I was his final grad student. Wow. So I wonder, do you have any stories or perhaps any lessons that you've taken from Walter? Oh, so many. Um, he was just such a phenomenal influence in my life. Um, I had to convince him to take me as a graduate student because um, his last his last student was Ethan Cross. So Walter had decided that that was going to be his final student, that after that he was going to teach, but that's it. He wasn't going to advise anymore. Um, and I decided I was going to change that. So <laughs> I, I really wanted to work with him. And so I just, I pursued him and I had, you know, one of the most interesting, I think, moments when I realized that this was this was someone that was going to teach me a lot when what convinced him to take me as a student was my being honest with him and telling him that I had no intention of going into academia. I said, I want to be a writer. I'm just fascinated by the human brain. I'm fascinated by your work. Um, I want to work with you. I want to study this. I want to do this together. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm not going to become a professor. I don't want to go on the job market. I don't care about academic publications. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I wouldn't want to go into academia today either. <laughs> and, and, and that, um, you know, he agreed to take me as a student and he just became, you know, he, he became such a mentor to me. He became a good friend, um, someone who, you know, would, come over for dinner with his wife, um, you know, we'd, we'd have them over. Um, and we had so many just fascinating conversations together. And I think some, some things that are, that stay, that stand out in my mind is the first time um, he came over. Um, and at the time, I lived in a fourth floor walk up apartment actually I still do but a different apartment. And I said, listen, you know, we can go out because at this point, he was 80, maybe 79, 80, something like that. I said, we can, we can go out, you know, because it's walk up. There are many flights of stairs. And he just, he looked at me and he said, Michelle, that's his wife. Um, Michelle and I love walk ups. What are you talking about? Our, our Paris apartment has five floors of, we're on a fifth floor walk up. We love stairs. And that just, that was Walter. Like he, and he just would saunter up the stairs. Um, and and that was the kind of person he was. Um, he was also a brilliant artist, a beautiful artist. His artwork was in his hung on his walls along with um, other just incredible painters. Um, he was an art collector, and he knew Serge Zabarsky, who was um, someone who had come from Austria like Walter, um, and had a huge art collection um, that became the Neue Gallery um, in New York, but at the time he was an art dealer. Um, and because they were friends, Walter has just had these incredible paintings um, that he was able to get way back when, you know, he had Schule's and Matisse's and all of these just beautiful, beautiful art on his walls. Um, and he loved, he loved life. He loved everything about it. So that's Walter. I loved in the book that you said that him and the big five were not on talking terms. <laughs> <laughs> this is correct. This is correct. I laughed that, but it seems as well as, you know, going through the book that another person which has, you know, impacted your life so much is Eric Seidel. Absolutely. So how would you describe Eric? <laughs> you know, it's funny. He and Walter actually have some 
characteristics in common um, in that they are both so passionate about life um, and have just this enthusiasm for everything. Um, and Eric is someone who, I mean, he's a brilliant poker player, obviously one of the best in the world um, and has been for a very long time. But he's also just a brilliant human being. He is just voracious about everything. He's someone who, you know, he reads everything. He listens to all of these podcasts. I don't know how he has the time. He knows he knows more than I do. You know, he's like, you know, I was listening to the New Yorker radio hour. It's like, I don't listen to the New Yorker radio hour every day. I'm not sure what was on today or the fiction podcast or this. He knows every single show. He loves theater. He'll go to London because just, you know, spend a week in the West End um, and in New York do the exact same thing. He loves art. He loves museums. Um, he loves living artists and collecting new art. Um, at some point, you know, he went to Cuba and got Cuban art from new Cuban artists. He loves food. He just, he loves experiences. And he is someone who is never bored. Um, and I think that that is, that's a beautiful trait. Um, and so I think one of the reasons I fell in love with poker was because Eric became my guide in that world and he was able to instill his love and his passion in me. Um, I think that it could have gone in a very different direction had it been someone else um, who played for the wrong reasons, who played because you know they just wanted money um, or who didn't understand the game on as deep a level as Eric does. So I think that I have a lot to thank him for in, in that regard. I don't think the biggest bluff would exist um, if it weren't for him. Yeah, and it seems as if, like, you know, when I was reading the book, that one of the defining moments really came down to that conversation, perhaps, was it on a park bench, where you showed him that not-released academia <laughs> analysis? It was, yeah, it was, uh, it was in um, it was in a cafe, oh, in a cafe. over breakfast. Yeah. Okay, so I'd love to just back up before we get to, you know, trying to chase down one of the greatest poker players of all time, to be a mentor. <laughs> I'd love to know, what was it specifically that drew you to poker? And then we can delve into the specifics from there. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's a really good question because I'm someone who does not like games. <laughs> I've never been a games player. You know, don't play chess. Um played chess briefly um, in elementary school during my first ever match was beaten by a kindergartner who <laughs> was five years old and that was the end of my uh, interest in playing chess <laughs> um, never really liked board games you know not not something that interested me and so it's it's very funny to have found myself as a poker player. Um, and I think if someone had told me, you know, five years ago, do you know that you will one day be a professional poker player? I would have said, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> um, what, what I was interested in was the idea of chance um, and of exploring the role that luck plays in our lives. And I came to poker from that angle because if you read about chance, it's not too long before you start thinking about game theory and kind of ways of looking at chance. And um, I started reading John von Neumann, um, his book, The Theory of Games, which is the foundational text of game theory, and realized that game theory came from poker, um, that actually von Neumann was a poker player, and that he thought that solving poker would give him a way to look at complex strategic decision making. And so when I read um, kind of the, the little bits that he wrote about poker in his book, about how it was such a good metaphor for life, because it's a game of incomplete information. Um, and it's a game of people. And it's a game of strategy on all of these different levels, you know, do you know what I know? Do I know what you know? You know, how, how can we kind of how can we parse that puzzle? I was like, this is fascinating. I should I should read more about this poker thing. And so I started reading about poker and it just clicked. I thought, oh, this this is a good book. You know, this is my way into luck because I was looking for a way into the topic um, because it's a such a big topic. I mean, it's, it's hard to, you can't say I'm writing a book about luck. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a book. You need a story. You need something. And so I thought, why don't I actually learn poker and have that use poker as a way of looking at all these themes of skill, of chance, of all of these kind of different um, different areas. And one thing that I've that I know 
is that mentors are important and uh, coaches are important. So I knew that I, I wanted to find someone who would help guide me through that process. Um, I got very lucky because Eric was my first choice and um, luckily he didn't tell me to go to hell. Um, instead, he <laughs> listened to me and uh, ultimately I was able to convince him um, that this was a good idea. I still don't know how. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it was, you know, maybe the the one in seven billion type of shot. But I'd love to <laughs> pick up on on something you just said there. So let me ask you, why would poker be a better metaphor for life than, let's say, something like chess? That's a very good question, and I think the answer um, is one that von Neumann gave himself. So he found games like chess and things like roulette, that which are at opposite extremes, quite boring. Mm -hmm. Because he thought chess was a very interesting game strategically, but it's a game of complete information. We, I, Everything's out there, and there's always a theoretically correct move. I can solve it, and I know exactly, if you give me enough computing power, I can tell you what I'm supposed to do. There's always an answer because everything is out there and you can play through all the permutations and all the knowledge is there. On the opposite end, you have something like roulette, which is just pure chaos, right? It's pure yeah. chance. There's nothing you can do. There's no skill involved. You know, it's just turning a wheel um, and that's it. So it's just pure gamble. And so that's also not interesting because it's just the opposite extreme. Poker to him was the true way of looking at decisions that would mirror life decisions because life is a game of incomplete information. Life isn't like chess because we never know all the pieces. We can't see the entire board. It's impossible. Life is noisy. You know, it's life is like chess, but you can't see half the board and the pieces might change and something you thought was the queen ends up being the bishop and, you know, it, and all, all the things. All things are changing all the time. But in poker, and especially in uh, No Limit Texas Hold'em, which is what he played, the, there's a very fine balance of known to unknown information. So they're my cards, and only I know them. You don't know what I have. But all you know is how I'm acting and what I'm telling you and the story I'm telling you. And your job is to try to figure out, you know, does my story make sense? You know, am I telling you what what's real or not? Um, and if I if I deceive you, then I'm going to win. And it's it's one of these things where it's when he looked at that, he said, "This is this is how life is. This is what strategic decision making is like." You know, we this is this is how it is to communicate with people, to negotiate with people, um, to be, you know, at a table. Because you have to remember that at the time, this guy who, you know, was saying, oh, poker is the, poker is the key to life. He was advising, you know, the U.S. government. He was working on the hydrogen bomb. Wow. Like, this is, a, this is someone who was involved at the highest levels of decision making. Um, and, you know, he, he said that real life, and this is, this is now an, a, a near near exact quote consists of bluffing of little tactics of deception of thinking to myself what does this man think i mean to do and that is what games are about in my theory that's poker that's not chess mm, i love that i love that um, one of the interesting things which i suppose uh your book really comes across is it really made me think about you know some real stoic philosophy yeah and and also it took me you know into um especially in the last few pages about you know things like superstition yeah. and i've got a quote here and it says i may not believe in superstition but i am coming to appreciate the power of belief in a broader sense <laughs> so how could we perhaps maybe even weaponize belief because it yeah. seems like you did i think that that's a really important distinction you know i think that Beliefs like superstitions are not helpful, that they actually hurt you more than they help, um, even if you don't realize it, because you're putting too much of your agency into external factors, and that's not good, because you're taking away control from yourself. But I think that the power of belief can actually be weaponized in the opposite way, by taking back agency, and uh, 
believing that you control a little bit more than you do, that, that you have a little more influence over outcomes than you actually do. And you know it's a lie, right? You know you're bluffing yourself. You know that it's <laughs> it's a it's a big bluff. But but you do it because that's the way that you can succeed by by just having that little extra belief that, you know, I can actually make a difference here. What I do will actually matter because it will motivate you. It will drive you. And it will actually probably make you more effective because in things like poker, perception is reality oftentimes. You know, people people often say fake it till you make it. And it's a cliche for a reason. There's actually a, a lot of truth to that because, you know, if you if you act the way you want to be perceived, if you kind of say say things that you might not quite believe at the moment, but you really want to believe them, it will eventually actually kind of seep through um, in reality. You know, I remember when I was just starting out as a writer um, and I was just, you know, still, still green and no one knew who I was. Um, and I remember the moment where I decided that I was going to start introducing myself to people as a writer. Um, and I'd only published a few things and I wasn't quite able to make a, a living doing it yet, but I wanted to force myself yeah. to, to do it. Um, and it was scary. I thought, oh my God, I'm a fake. You know, I'm not a real writer. Um, I've only published these few things, but, but I did it. Um, and eventually it became true. <laughs> I love how that become like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, yeah. That. Well, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy is a really powerful thing. I mean, our minds are incredibly powerful. That's why I don't like superstitions because they go both ways. If you believe, you know, that something's bad, you're you might actually experience bad outcomes. And if one of your lucky objects disappears, you might actually that might actually screw you up a little bit because you know you really. You know, you, you believe that. Um, and we were so, you know, our minds are so powerful. That's why, you know, I, I do this podcast um, segment on a, you know, a, a few times a month um, for Slate. Um, there's a podcast called The Gist. And I do this segment called Is That Bullshit? And we talk about different topics, um, whether or not they're bullshit or not. And um, a lot of the times we'll talk about medical things or scientific things. And we'll talk about, you know, placebos. And people get really mad at me. They're like, oh, well, you know, you're calling it a placebo, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I love placebos. Our brains are so powerful. I don't care why it's working. If it's a placebo, but it's working, that's amazing. If just the fact that you believe in it makes it work, how cool is that? You're not actually doing anything, and yet you are. And it's you. You're the one who's making yourself feel better. How great is that? And so people, you know, people give me a lot of shit for saying for you talking about things as a placebo when they are. And I say, and all I want to tell them is, no, this is wonderful. Saying something as a placebo is not an insult. It's, it's a compliment because a placebo means it works. Yeah. And, and I just did an episode from the F with, um, Dr. Will Bolshevitz, and we were talking about just how powerful the placebo is. And, and he told me that in fact, in medicine, that a placebo as an effect of anywhere from around 10 to 40 percent and for an actual pill to be introduced it actually has to be over the placebo markers mm -hmm. yeah. and, it, and it made me think there was um this example which i give on the show before and i was um speaking to alex hutchinson about this and he's, he's a journalist who focuses on running and sort of the power of you know uh, the mind mm -hmm. And I remember this one time in which for months and months when I was a lot younger, I was trying to get this uh, squat personal best. And I just, I just couldn't do it. And I went to a different gym and they had a different plate set up. And I didn't, and I didn't know how much was on the bar. <laughs> and because of this, I, I, I said to my friend, I was like, oh, I just did this. And he's like, oh, wow. He's like, last week, he's like, when we were in a different gym, you couldn't do it. I was like... <laughs> And I was like, I had enough, and I was like, how can like this be? And, <laughs> and, and in your work, you, you even had a differentiation in between how, whether we perceive ourselves as a victim or a victor, mm -hmm. that, that we can sort of live out either one of those prophecies. Could we talk Absolutely. about this? 
Absolutely. I mean, it's something that I think poker has really solidified in my mind. Um, and that Eric Seidel was, was very, was very central also in solidifying in my mind. And that's just how important mindset is and how much it matters that things we don't think matter actually do you know the habits that you use when describing things how you describe something that happened how you describe an event because the words that you use to describe it actually mirror how you're thinking about it how you're thinking about it in your mind how you're perceiving it how you're experiencing it and the way that this came out in poker is I, I lost a big hand and I ran to Eric and started telling him about it. And he just stopped me and said, you know, do you have a question about the, how the hand played out? And I didn't because it was just what's in poker called a bad beat where, you know, you're ahead and then someone else, it's called sucking out, <laughs> sucks out on you and they end up winning. Um, and it hurts and it happens a lot um, and you just have to deal with it and he told me I don't care unless you have a question about the process about how you played the hand I don't want to hear it and I said but you know can't I vent and he said <laughs> and he said no you can't because I don't want you thinking about it I don't want you focusing on this forget the outcome did you make the right decision when the money went in were you ahead Yes, I was. I had a set. He had a draw. I was far ahead. Um, so I made the right decision. End of story. Forget the run out. Forget the cards. Forget what happened. When you made the decision, was it the right decision? And it was just, it was, and he actually, he had this wonderful phrase. He said, telling a bad beat story is like putting your garb, is like dumping your garbage on someone else's lawn. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, you know, it's actually true in more ways than one. Because telling it is dumping your garbage on someone else's lawn, but also focusing in on, on it internally and actually remembering it and letting it kind of sit on you. It's like having garbage inside of you. It's like you're the trash receptacle. You haven't put it on someone else's lawn yet, but it's there. And so what you need to teach yourself to do is actually forget it. You know, just toss that garbage right away so that it doesn't even sit. You think, you know, I am the victor here because I made the right decision. And because I made the right decision, I won, even though I lost. Because the outcome doesn't matter. What matters is, did I make the right decision? And if I had won the hand, but I had made the wrong decision, well, now we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Now you actually made a mistake. And so that's something you can learn from. That's something that you can do. But if you think about it, the focus is on you. It's not on the outcome. It's not on the run out of the cards. The focus is on what you can control yourself, your own actions, your own reactions. And so your frame has to have you as the actor not as someone to whom things are happening. And if you think about if you think about it that way in your mind, then all of a sudden you actually perceive the world in different ways because you don't think that things are happening to you. You think, okay, how am I what am I doing? How am I affecting, you know, the how am I how am I affecting what's happening? Because I can't control things that are happening to me, but I can control things that I make happen and reactions and emotional reactions um, and what I choose to focus on and what I choose to not focus on, what I choose to remember and what I choose to forget. And once you get into that habit, it actually, it changes so much. So these days, I don't even remember usually how I busted out of a poker tournament. I, like I literally don't remember I after, after a while because I remember if I made a mistake right? If it was an interesting hand, I remember. But if it was something like, you know, I got it all in with aces and they got cracked by kings, I I forget it because, you know, it happens and it happened and there's nothing you can do and the outcome doesn't matter. But it makes me, it's so, it, it lightens your load. It lightens your mental load because you don't have to worry about it. It doesn't occupy your mental space. Instead, you just you just move on, move on to the next thing and think, okay, what's next? What can I do? How can I improve? What mistakes did I make? Um, how can I play better next time? Yeah, I find this so, such a, so liberating to think that I could, you know, play a perfect hand and still lose and that luck is this sort of guiding principle. I think I struggled with that a lot when I was younger. I think that people, perhaps more 
uh, that would be higher in conscientiousness. They would typically, I suppose, take more responsibility for things. But I guess would the lesson from this be that we can sometimes play a perfect hand, but luck is a factor at play. This isn't chess. And that sometimes we can, we can do the right things and still not get the desired outcome. Absolutely. And we can even put a probability on how often that's going to happen. That's a wonderful thing that poker di- that poker gives you. It gives you this way of looking at things in terms of probabilities. I do everything correctly and I'm an 80% favorite. That means 20% of the time, I'm not going to win. And you know what? I'm going to make that exact same decision over and over and over because 80% is a lot more than 20. And more often than not, I'll be just fine. But there will be that 20%. And you know what it also teaches you? You can be a 98% favorite and still lose. That 2% happens and it will happen. And it's happened to me. I mean, I bubbled a tournament, which means you're the last person out before the money during the World Series of Poker when I got it all in with Ace Jack against Ace Jack and uh, the other person made a flush. That happens 2% of the time. It happened. And you see it and you say, oh, will I do the exact same thing again? Absolutely, I will. Because, you know, 98% of the time I'm fine. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Let's touch on some decision making. And I've got a another quote here from the book. And you said, I began to genuinely wonder if in poker, I could finally find a way to overcome all, sorry, my all too human inability to disentangle chance from skill in the morass of daily life and instead learn to master it. So I suppose there's so, so many questions in which I could ask you, but I'll just throw you a a hand grenade with a big open-ended question. (laughs) What would be some or any decision-making lessons which you would like to share with us from your this incredible venture you had into poker <laughs> oh there there's so <laughs> I many apologize for that question. no I no there there are so many i think one of the first ones that really stuck with me because it was something that i thought i understood very well um was the sunk cost fallacy so the sunk cost fallacy um is when you basically look at something that you've already done, right? So sometimes if it's a literal sunk cost, like maybe you put a down payment or on something, or maybe you bought a bunch of stocks, you know, or maybe, you know, you bought a share of something, whatever it is, and you've already put money in. But it can also be time. You know, you've already spent 10 hours on this. You've already spent a year on this. You've already spent X amount on this. It could be emotion. You know, I've already spent so much, you know, emotional investment with this. It, it could be anything. It could be reputation. Can you I, know, can my I company. In, sorry, Marie. So, yeah. so with this sunk cost, obviously, would this be perhaps why someone that's perhaps in a toxic relationship would think, well, you know, I've invested four years into this. Yes, you, you, you bought you, you kind of you got a step ahead of me. That's that's where oh, I was sorry. going with this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the sunk cost fallacy is when you look at these costs, and rather than say it's a sunk cost, it's already happened. What I can do now, the thing I can control, is to just cut cut my losses and just make the best of the time I have now, the emotions I have now, the money I have now. If it was a bad investment, I shouldn't keep putting money into it. If it was a bad time investment, I shouldn't keep spending time on it. If it was a bad emotional investment, I shouldn't keep that toxicity going. Instead, I should focus on the future. I can't change the past. I can't change what I've already done. What I can change is now and the future, right? I can change what I'm going to do. And so many times we don't do that because there's just something psychologically about having invested so much already that we just can't let it go. Um, and it's true on every level. I mean, investors are known for this. They hold on to losers because they don't want to have those losses be crystallized. And like you said, in relationships, we hold on to toxic relationships because we've already been in them for so long. When I was in graduate school, I saw people who were miserable 
miserable, who should have dropped out of the program, who realized they hated it, but who were like, oh, well, I've already spent a year in the program. I might as well finish it. Like, you have five years left. That's five <laughs> years of your life and you're miserable. Why, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, but they already, you know, they and they didn't leave. And then you have a lot of very miserable people who are in the wrong careers. I'm sure that happened in law school and in business school and all these all these other areas as well. Um, and so what poker really teaches you is it shows you what the sunk cost fallacy does immediately. Because if you are unable to let go of a good hand when the board texture changes and your hand is no longer as good as it was pre-flop, you're going to lose a lot of money. The people who are unable to fold top pair, who are unable to fold pocket aces, which is the best hand in poker, you know, who just can't let it go, are the people who are going to be ultimately losers because they just can't, you know, they can't deal with it. Um, and so poker just forces you to realize that your hand is only as good as the moment as the context and so pocket aces become worthless once the flop comes eight nine ten all hearts and you don't have the ace of hearts you know that all of a sudden your pocket aces are are garbage they're seven deuce offsuit which is the worst hand in poker and you've got to be able to let them go if people you know if someone bets and someone raises and all this stuff happens you can't be saying i have pocket aces you know, I have the best hand. I can't fold. Um, and so it teaches you to let go of the sunk cost fallacy. And I found that I was able to start doing that more in life the deeper I got into into the poker world. So that's just one example, but I think it's one that we all experience in so many different parts of our lives. And that is so powerful. And I think it will save people so much time and heartache to just take that lesson to heart and to and to realize that just because you did something in the past does not mean you have to keep doing it. Yeah. It really doesn't. You should always be willing to do something different, to change direction, to change your mind. Actually, the sunk cost fallacy also comes to beliefs. People say, well, I define myself as this type of person who believes in this. I, it's part of who I am. I can't change my mind about it. Um, and actually, yes, you can. Um, and that doesn't make you a worse person or detract from who you are think it makes you a bigger person a lot of people value consistency over actually learning and i think consistency is really overvalued yeah i'd love to pick up on that because when i think about cognitive biases i think you know when i think about them that they are really good at explaining why we did something but they're so difficult to sort of use them in the moment like for example i listen to daniel Kahneman really mm -hmm. the godfather of these cognitive biases. And, and this, this has worried me. I've lost sleep over this. And Coleman said, I studied cognitive biases my entire life, and I'm still no better at them than yep. anyone else. Yep. So I wonder, how could we actually put, say, something like the sunk cost fallacy into practice? So, um, and I've, I've actually talked to, to Danny Kahneman about this. Wow. Um, and he, so... Poker is actually this, it's almost like a, like a magic bullet as or as close as it gets to a lot of these things. Because one of the reasons that the biases are so difficult to fight in everyday life is because understanding them doesn't make them go away. Right? Knowing them cognitively doesn't make them go away. Because our brain doesn't work that way. Our brain learns from experience. It learns from doing. It learns from doing over and over and over. And normally in life, all of these biases can't be corrected because our experiences are so skewed. We don't sample probabilistically. We don't sample enough. You know, one thing happens and our brains learn from that thing, even though that thing, you know, we don't know if it had a, you know, one chance in 10 of happening or one in a thousand or one in a million. We have no idea. Um, but our brain learns, oh, this happens. If I do this, that happens. And so the biases kind of become entrenched. In poker, a lot of these things are happening, but you're actually learning from experience because you're playing and you're getting feedback and you're losing money or you're winning money um, and you're sampling correctly because you're playing hundreds and thousands of hands and hundreds of thousands of hands if you play online. And all of a sudden, you're actually learning what the likelihoods of these things feel like. You suddenly know what 80% feels like. You know what 50% feels like. You know, you know what these things actually feel like in reality. And so your biases 
become corrected that way if you're aware of it. Now, this that's a crucial thing. So, if a Daniel Kahneman plays poker, he's going to find a lot of his biases. He'll be able to overcome a lot of the ones that he couldn't. Um, and not all of them, by the way. It's not like poker is a cure to every single cognitive bias. Just a, a good amount of decision-making biases, but not everything, clearly. Um, but someone who doesn't have that background or that desire might be a great poker player and then suck at life and make horrible decisions because they don't have that metacognitive awareness or that desire and they don't actually translate what happens at the table to real life. And so I think you need both. You need both the, you need both the abstract knowledge and kind of the, the background, but then the experience that you can get is a way to help root it out in real life. That said, you know, it's it's not a magic bullet in more ways than one. Um, not only does it not help with every bias, but even the ones it helps with, you still have to be constantly mindful and aware in order to actually execute it. Like, I was, you know, well into my poker project when I found myself, you know, in the throes of planning fallacies and sunk cost fallacies and all of these things that I could identify in retrospect, but in the moment, um, I was not quite so good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. One one of the things in which I would say, you know, it's, it's interesting how people take different things from books. I think the one of the lines in your book which hit me the hardest on this topic of decision making was I believe you said something like, um, "There's no security in passive decisions." And mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you give the lesson of say, you know, someone sitting at the poker table. And although they, you know, they're not going down on any hands, their chips are still going down. Yeah. And, and I suppose that this is applicable to life because someone could have a fear of failure, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, actively choose not to pursue things. But I mean, at the same time, whilst they're not, whilst they're playing not to lose, they're also not winning. Absolutely. So I wonder if you could talk about, you know, passivity in a decision making role. For sure, for sure. I think a lot of people, including me, I mean, this was something I really had to overcome. So I don't want people to listen to this and think, oh, you know, people. Yeah, me. <laughs> this was a big problem I had. Um, I'm a person. Um, is they, they mistake passivity for, for safety. They think that, you know, if I'm passive, then everything will be more or less okay. Then I can't screw up because at least I didn't do anything. What they don't realize is that's also a decision, and that's actually doing something. Doing nothing is a decision to not do something. That's that's actually a really, talk about mental frames and kind of ways of looking at things. That's a really important way to see it, because a, a decision to not do anything is going to cost you, not just you know money because when you're sitting at the poker table, your, your chips are going down, but it's going to cost you opportunities. It's going to cost you kind of, it's going to cost you image. It's going to cost you a lot of different things. And it actually can be much less safe because eventually you'll get into a desperate situation where you've been passive for so long that you're forced to act and you actually have to act not at the optimal moment and not because you decide that it's the right moment but because you have to because in in poker you're going to blind down and you realize that oh no you know if i don't play now if i don't put all my chips in the middle if i don't shove um i'm gonna i'm gonna be out of this tournament i'm done um and it, there are lots of parallels in life when all of a sudden you realize you know oh shit like i now i have to act because my i basically tied my own hands by being inactive for so long and you never want to put yourself in that situation. You want to be the one deciding when to act and how to act, not because you're forced to by external circumstances, if you can avoid to. If you can avoid it, you know, sometimes circumstances are going to force force your hand, and that's inevitable. But at least you don't want to get there by virtue of your own passivity and your own kind of failure to to take more decisive action. And, you know, I found that my passivity was, was costing me a lot and it was costing me a lot both in poker um, and in, in real life. I, I kind of realized how often, you know, I would just defer to people and say, oh, you know, you must be right. You probably know more than I do. You probably know better. Oh, you probably have the stronger hand. I'm just going to fold. <laughs> I'm going to believe you. It's, it's not something that I ever really thought about 
you know, how many times have I been bluffed in life and just meekly accepted it because I thought, okay, I guess, I guess I'm going to go away now. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things it seems to me like that reading the book that you really uh, transformed in the sense of was when you made the decision to um, turn the decision making momentum onto your side. And I think that you gave this example in the book that there was a publisher or, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm mistaken, but it was someone that um, wanted you to write an article for their site. And instead of just originally making an offer, you sort of flipped the decision-making momentum. So I'd love mm-hmm. to, could we talk about this, about, you know, sort of flipping that decision-making momentum and sort of, um, you know, more inquiry type of thing, <laughs> which, which I absolutely love. Could we talk about that? Sure. Well, well, let's start with the with the second part of that. Um, when you say more inquiry, that's actually half a quote from Eric. Um, one of the things that most stuck with me, and it's so funny because if you if you talk to him, he'll say, "Oh, I'm really not eloquent," and I want to say, "You you have such eloquent phrases. <laughs> you have just these absolute brilliant insights." And there was something he said to me early on, um, which he'd actually told another poker player, which is less certainty, more inquiry. And to me, that was just such a profound statement because it just, it's a way of reframing everything. You you never know everything. You can never be certain of everything. So all, all you can do is just question and always question yourself, question the process, question what's going on so that you can come to the best decision process, so that you can make the best decision, so that you can grow and become better. And if you're constantly inquiring and you're never sure of anything, it saves you from false confidence. It saves you from a lot of these biases that happen if you just, you know, decide this is the way to do it. This is the way it's done. Um, and, you know, if you look at history, so many great insights come from people who do things totally differently, who who think of things in new ways. So many, you know, advances in, in a field come from people outside that field who don't know how it's done in that field. And so they, they think of something totally new and it works. Um, not always, but a lot of times that's what happens because you're not constrained and you're thinking and you're inquiring. So that's kind of, I think that that's such a huge component of what I learned. Um, and it's such a huge component of decision making that can make you kind of change the decision momentum because once again, it's putting it back on you. And I think that certainty is also was related to my passivity and to my lack of momentum because I knew that I didn't know. And so I just thought, oh, well, they must know, right? They must have the certainty. And so I, rather than realize that, no, nobody knows, <laughs> there's actually, there's no right way. I would say, well, I don't know the right way. I don't have, so I'm just going to fold. I'm just going to, I'm just going to st- take a step back because I don't know. Um, and so I think that the two things are connected in that way, realizing that, Nobody knows that it's always a, a, a constant process of growing, that you're allowed to make mistakes. Um, I think that that really freed me up to actually do things, to experiment and to realize that I needed to kind of, to put myself in a position where I was acting rather than being acted upon. Yeah. And, and in terms of that, um, you know, that sort of mantra of, you know, less certainty, more inquiry. You know, I, I think one of the things which startled me the most when I was going through your book was w- the bit about the dragonfly. So <laughs> when you talk about how you know that in in the jungle you think about the you know these you know these apex predators, the lion, the tiger, the cougar, and you break down you know that they they are success rates, and yeah. then you were like, but actually the predator with the highest. <laughs> With the highest success rate is actually the dragonfly, which is about ninety five percent. Yeah. So I wonder, in terms of um, that mantra of you know, like less would be more inquiry. What can the dragonfly actually teach us? <laughs> I never thought I would ever say that. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I was so it was it was so funny to me to discover that to discover that bit of research, um, and I I dub Eric the the dragonfly because you never see him coming, um, and he's so unassuming and he's so humble and he's so quiet. And whenever anyone you know talks about oh the best poker players, they inevitably especially if they're not in the world of poker will name other people who are much more flamboyant who are much more the wolves and yeah. the tigers <laughs> and the foxes and kind of the 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 big guys um and people uh people ignore the dragonfly it's just kind of but it's there and the dragonfly is so deadly effective it's crazy <laughs> um so and you never see it coming and I think that, that that does come a lot from this constant attitude of inquiry because Eric is able to adjust to other players, to change his style, to change his colors, so to speak, depending on where he is, where he finds himself, because he's constantly moving. He's constantly anticipating. He's constantly trying to figure out what's correct now. Not what was correct yesterday, not what was correct against this opponent, not, you know, what does the theory say is correct? What's correct now? Let me just take this moment on its own. Let me make the best decision possible. And so few people do that, but that enables him to strike with much greater accuracy because he's actually making his attack, you know, very, very just unique to this moment, to this person, to this play. And, you know, that's, that's a very dragonfly way of being. And I think that that's why he's able to kill opponent after opponent. And by kill, I mean knock out of tournaments. Eric is the least violent person I've ever, <laughs> I've ever known. Um, but I think that, I think that, that, constant process of inquiry also makes you much more nimble it makes you much more maneuverable it makes you much more able to change in the moment when you need to yeah i love that i love that principle of you know just being curious just being curious i i, I love that so much what would be um so you talked about you know these um cognitive biases you mentioned um uh, though the one fallacy in terms of the you know sunk costs, what would be perhaps one other decision making metric which you learned from this venture into the world of poker? Well, I think that's something that we've already talked about, but I'd just like to um, make more explicit is kind of this understanding of probabilities and this understanding of probabilistic thinking and kind of this understanding of the fact that there is no certainty. You know, in, in poker, nothing is 100%, right? Whenever you're making a decision, because there's always unknown information, you're never going to be 100% certain. That doesn't exist. And so people often will look for false certainty um, or will believe in false certainty. And it's so important to let go of that and to become comfortable with uncertainty, comfortable with the fact that you're never going to have all the information, that it's just not possible. And then to learn to just make the best decision you can when the probabilities are on your side. If it's bigger than 50%, that's amazing. And poker has taught me that. And poker has taught me that 1% matters, 2% matter. That's a huge, huge edge. That's a huge difference. Because normally people will say, oh, you know, there's no difference between 60 and 62%. There is. There's a lot of difference. And you actually learn to tell that. And you learn to actually calibrate your own decisions and your own certainties in the same way. You know, I've become much more circumspect of the way that I speak, of the way that I just communicate with other people after playing poker because I've realized just how often I exaggerate. And so now I will say things like, oh, you know, this is going to happen. And I, then I'll say like, oh, well, you know, I'm 75% certain that that's going to happen. I'll say things like that. And people will sometimes look at me like I'm a little weird, but it's very helpful because it kind of opens up the window that you, I, I'm not sure. And then it also makes me question it because sometimes I'll realize that I'm less certain than I thought I was. And so I'll want to look it up and it actually kind of helps me fact check myself and think, oh, wait, why am I so certain about this? You know, do I have a good reason to be? No, I don't. 
uh oh, you know, now now I need to kind of rewind and I've become much more attuned to that process internally. And I don't think it would have been possible without poker because probabilities are hard. I mean, I suck at math, you know, I'm, <laughs> probabilities are not my strong suit. But but poker has really helped me um, see the world in those terms and realize, you know, that that we can only we can only do so much, right? We can only be so good and that's okay. Like it, it's okay if it's not a hundred percent, that's fine. <laughs> you know, 75% is pretty good. Um, well, it depends on what, if we're talking about a test uh, that, that looks at uh, whether or not you've had a disease, 75% is not very good. <laughs> Neither is 95%. <laughs> but if you're, if you're making a, a normal decision, then all of a sudden it can be very good. I love it. I love it. In terms of um, poker, because this is obviously one of the things where the win ratio is typically very low, what would your advice be on dealing with something like failure? How did you become more resilient? I think part of it is in trying to divorce yourself from the outcome and it, to realizing that you know, chance is going to happen, you know, these things are going to happen, and it's not personal, it has nothing to do with you, the cards don't care about you, you know, they're, they're just there, the deck doesn't care about you, it's, it's really just noise, it's an outcome, it's, it's just, it's variance, and variance can go in any direction, and I can't do anything about that. And so understanding that and accepting that actually makes you much more resilient because you you realize, okay, I shouldn't dwell on the things I can't control. And sometimes the variance is going to go against me. And sometimes it's going to just beat me down over and over and over. What can I do about that? Well, nothing. But what I can do is control how I react, control how I process it, control what I take from it, control how I frame it in my mind, and what I do next. That I can control. So let me focus on that and let me actually just accept and be okay with the things that I couldn't control rather than sit here and curse fate and say, I'm so unlucky. Poor me. I can't believe this happened to me. That is not useful. That is not productive. That's not going to do get me anywhere or do anything. Yeah, maybe something terrible happened and it sucks, you know, and but I can't change it. And if I can't change it, then why in the world am I expending energy and emotion on it? Yeah, that's such a good answer. That's such a good answer. And I think it, you know, brings it back nicely in terms of focusing on the internal locus of control. Yeah. The, one other thing in which I'd love to um, pick up on in terms of this is when I read the book, it seemed as if going, you know, from start to finish, as if you personally underwent. Uh, an enormous transformation. I mean, it seems as if the character in which I was relating to at the start of the book was like a whole nother person, <laughs> end, which I found was just completely amazing. What would be perhaps one thing in which you could offer in terms of raising our confidence? <laughs> be a dragonfly. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Be a dragonfly. Be someone who doesn't care so much about how you look because dragonflies are not very attractive. I mean, maybe if you're an etym etymologist, no, not <laughs> etymologist, and to, who, who's, who's a person who studies something like that? The person who studies, etymologist studies the origin of words. But if you're, if you're someone who studies insects, maybe the dragonfly will be beautiful to you. But if you're me outside and this big thing is coming, you know, at your face, it's not necessarily my idea of beauty um, or it's not, it's not my idea of, you know, something I want to be. But that's OK. Don't care what you that you look like a little alien with a weird head. You know, that's that doesn't matter. What matters is how effective are you? You know, what's your kill rate? How able and why is it that way because one of the things about the dragonfly is it's so good because it anticipates what its prey is going to do before the prey does it it's so good at paying attention and actually 
looking and really being present that it can sense motion and it can sense anticipated motion well in advance. And that's just amazing. Imagine if you could have that skill, right? And, and we can cultivate some of those skills by being attentive, by being present, by being mindful, by actually putting ourselves kind of in the world and really focusing on others, focusing on what they're doing so that we can anticipate what they're going to do and so that we can just not care about appearances, but care about effectiveness and care about doing the best we can and being as effective as we are. And by 95% kill rate, I don't necessarily mean literal kill rate. Actually, I don't mean that at all. I just mean, you know, becoming much more precise in reaching your targets because you're so much more effective at doing it and you don't care about the optics. Instead, you care about the performance and you... I think also become a better person when you're a more attentive person because yes, you can anticipate what people are going to do, but that also means you understand them more. That also means you're listening to them more. That also means that you're just more present um, and you can anticipate their needs, not just their actions. And you can be, you know, a dragonfly in the sense of rather than killing them, offering them a chair because you realize that they're going to need it. Yeah, it's such. A, I have to give you credit because it's such a bizarre and such an apt metaphor. <laughs> so beautifully put. But I'd love to ask. I was asking this at the end of all the podcasts. What books have impacted your life, Maria? So many, um, and it really depends on which stage of my life. But most of them, you know, the books that. I think impacted me earliest on were actually children's books. So the books that I used to come back to as an adult that I realized really affected a lot of how I think were books like Winnie the Pooh. And <laughs> no, I'm serious. Okay. I think it's such a deeply philosophical book. I mean, if you think about Winnie the Pooh in the sense of Taoism and Buddhism. I mean, it's amazing. Look at Winnie's attitude, like his, his way of going through life. I mean, the guy's just a philosophical savant. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> and then, and, you know, things like Alice in Wonderland and The Little Prince, like the books that really, that I read when I was little had a huge effect on me. Sorry, there's an airplane. <laughs> and, and there are things that I've really kind of, that I've really gone back to over and over. And then of course there are, you know, there are other books. There was one book that really I think changed the course of a lot of a lot of my career when I read it in high school, which was Oliver Sacks's The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. I remember reading that for a psychology class and thinking like, oh my God. Just I love psychology. Like he made me fall in love with psychology. And I thought and I also thought, wow, you can write this way? you know, you, you're a doctor and you write like this, this is amazing. Steven Pinker had a similar effect on me and he actually became one of my advisors as an undergraduate. Wow. So I, I was able to work with him. But he, you know, his books also had that effect when someone can write so beautifully and so eloquently about the mind. Um, and so in a very different way from Winnie the Pooh, I think those books had a big, had a big effect on the trajectory that my career took. Winnie the Pooh, I mean, you know, you you keep blowing my mind. I have to go back and read it. I mean, you know, it's, it's oh, wow. It's, Everyone was... who listens to this podcast, go and reread Winnie the Pooh. You will just be blown away. A. a. Milne is incredible. Also, his poetry is so good. I love poetry. I read a lot of poetry. A. a. Milne's poetry for children is so good. Wow. My mind has been blown. My mind has been blown. I will go back and read it. Um what would be one thing you'd love people to take away from the biggest bluff? I think the one thing that I would like people to take away is that you can't control it all and that's okay. Um, and you never know what tomorrow will hold. I mean, could we have, could we have predicted that, you know, we'd be going through the moment in time we're going through right now? I don't think anyone could have predicted it last year. I mean, people did predict it in broad terms, but they didn't know what it was going to look like. They didn't know when it was coming. And I think one of the things that I really took away from this journey is to just be at peace with that and to really appreciate kind of appreciate the day-to-day -day more, appreciate the moment, appreciate 
the things that we do know and that we do have because uncertainty is always going to be a part of life. Um, and to think that you can somehow change that is, is very hubristic. Um, instead, I think we need to be humble in its face and yet um, really still do our best to control what we can um, and to really maximize our actions, maximize our reactions, our emotions, the things that are within us to change. I love it. I love it. Maria, where can our Freedom Pack family connect with you? Um, I think the best ways to connect with me are either on Twitter, where I'm at mkonnikova, or on Instagram, where I'm girl named Maria, but girl without an I. Not because I can't spell girl, but because <laughs> someone got girl named Maria with an I before I did. Um, and those are the places where I'm most active. I'm hardly ever on Facebook, um, but I do try to get back to people if they send me messages on either of those two platforms. And I also give updates on what's happening with my book and with other things. Um, that's where that's where those will be. Maria, this has been fantastic. And those links you mentioned will be linked below so whoever listening can just swipe up. And the biggest bluff is out June 23rd, I want to say. June 23rd. Yeah. So we will, when this episode comes out, the book will be now available. So Maria, thank you so much for your time. The last thank 48 you. hours, but you've blown my mind in multiple ways. <laughs> <laughs> so Thanks I seriously so can't thank you enough. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs>